you've got to remember the law of the farm. You cannot sow something today and reap tomorrow. A seed has to go through various seasons before it turns into a fully blown tree. So is the case with investments. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. Uh, Parag Parekh, uh, y'all would have heard that uh, he passed away in a uh, car accident uh, in Omaha. But I'm not here to tell you how he died, but rather about how he lived. So I'll just talk about that, about how he lived, because only after he's not there do I realize what an inspiration he was to people. Uh, um, the way he lived his life was full of courage, full of humility, um, full of uh, doing things his way which he thought was right and uh, most of the time he, they were right. So I'll just start from the beginning you know. Uh, he had a pretty tough childhood. Uh, he was born with polio uh, and that was pretty hard, uh, just having that handicap uh, while growing up. Also, while he was really young, uh, he, had, he was hospitalized because of jaundice and not the kind of jaundice we have right now, but a really serious kind of jaundice which uh, he was in really critical condition. So, for the formative years of his life, well, while he was young growing up in school he had a lot of uh, medical issues uh, but one thing was he never let his handicap get in the way of anything uh, he used to tell me he used to play sports he used to play cricket he used to play football he used to play table tennis so he never let he, he never let his handicap come in the way of anything uh, and i think that is the thing that made him really resilient at a very young age and uh, made him really confident in the sense that I can do anything and I think after seeing his life I think he's done a whole lot you know uh, somebody could easily have been discouraged by what he went through in the beginning of his life but uh, he didn't he continued to grow though I keep joking with him that he must have got a lot of people run out in your days but he keeps telling me no that didn't happen so that's good uh, so when he grew up, uh, so like I said, it was a bit tough. Uh, we weren't really very affluent, came from a middle class family. Uh, the funny story then about he did his schooling uh, like a normal child does. Uh, uh, story that how he got into the stock markets is, uh, is, 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 is it's, uh, it's pretty good, you know. So he was in his, he was in college, he was in an entrepreneurial uh, uh, entrepreneurial class and they had to make a final project about a company that they would want to start or they would want to uh, they would want to build and his project was on plastic collapsible tubes uh, so he thought it was a great idea uh, he made a whole project and very excited about it and the funny thing is that he was the only person in his class who failed that and when he asked the professor uh, what was wrong why did, I, why did you fail me he said that it's a very bad business idea plastic tubes and sweet inside if there's toothpaste inside that rats are there in our country rats will eat it up and it's not a very viable project so he failed so he was really disheartened and a bit depressed with that so uh, that's why he his collaboration with Mr. Chandrakan Sampat started. So he went and met Mr. Chandrakan Sampat, and um, he said, "Kaka, this is what happened. Uh, I failed, and uh, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I thought it was a great, uh, great idea." So Chandrakan uncle took his report card. He read it. He had like a smoke on his face, and he said that I'm so glad you failed this. Uh, so my dad was a little confused. Why would you say why that? Why did I, why did I fail it? He's like, if you can analyze a business so so well, if you can 
in the future think that okay these are the business that are going to do good then why do you want to start open your own factory have your own company where uh, where you can where the government can be a problem labor issues etc etc raw material issues he's like there's a better way to do this if you can if you can analyze business so well there's a stock market out there for you where you can invest in whichever companies you like whichever businesses you like you invest in them and tomorrow if there's something wrong with the business or you stop liking the business you can actually uh, liquidate it without without ever having any other problems so that's how he got into the stock market uh, uh, so out of a failure something great happened and uh, um, so while he was getting his uh, bsc membership uh, we didn't have enough money at that point so my mother and my grandmother had to sell their jewelry and fund fund the bsc card uh, all my mother asked at that point was i don't care about jewelry i don't care about anything else you just make me travel i love traveling you take me you, ta you take me traveling and i think uh, my dad actually that was one promise he really really kept he really made my mom travel and that's what she wanted so that's how he got into the stock market uh, later on uh, there was the harshad mehta scam uh, in 93 and uh, harshad mehta and my father they started the careers together they were together in new india assurance uh doing their internships and from there they both started off and uh, this is where his courage to say no or like going against the herd really set in because he's like if i have my value systems if i have my own philosophies if i know right from wrong then i don't want to do anything wrong and when uh, when harshad mehta asked him that you know have a hotline here in your office with mine he was like no way i'm not doing it because if you made money so fast if you've grown so fast that's not possible that's called cancer and uh, he refused to do that and uh, a lot of his peers at that point did all these things and they got very they, they got rich very fast and my dad didn't he was right there you know he was just doing his job very honestly and he continued to do it but when this whole thing actually burst in everyone's face a lot of those people who had made money didn't have a job or the businesses run out or were in depression or a whole lot of other things i think that's what gave him the conviction of doing the right things all the time you know because he's like longevity is what you need you know if you do the right things you grow at a reasonable rate there's no way why you cannot survive he was the first one actually funnily enough he always wanted to innovate he always wanted to do something against the herd he always wanted to uh, challenge the status quo and uh, that's what he did you know he innovated uh, when he started he was one of the first people who actually had formal research that's how research in india was first introduced he started the research he had one pagers that he would go and give the institution the institutions were so impressed that at that point a lot of the institutions the big mnc banks that were coming in because this was around liberalization time they all impaneled with us and for a small broker to be impaneled with all these guys was uh, probably something unheard of so that's how where our institution business uh, took off we got impaneled with pretty much everyone and that's where we that's where we started getting that that's where his uh, uh, his uh, professional life started taking off uh one of the changing moments in his life was the tech boom uh why the tech boom is because he always he always was a value investor he always wanted values he obviously what didn't want to change chase, chase fancies i mean i'm sure y'all have heard a lot of times when you chase a fancy you pay a fancy price after the fancy ends you're lost you're left with a fancy loss i think at that point that those were the things that came to his mind and at that point in, uh, we started our portfolio uh, pms uh, in 1996 so 1999 uh, 2000 uh, was when the tech boom was happening and we did not have even one technology stock you know and those were probably doubling every week a lot of clients came and he's like parag what do you have you have lever itc colgate gillette all these companies but you don't have any technology stocks so he was like yeah well i mean these are the undervalued stocks these have great business prospects 
and technology this dot com stuff i really don't understand and i don't know why would anyone play 2000 3000 pe for all these stocks which don't even have any revenues or don't have any valuations or don't have any business for that matter so they are like uh, so they were like uh, yeah well but they're going up so that's like yeah they've gone up so you should sell it you know now you should sell it i mean they've already gone up so why not they should come back a week later thanks for our garden listen to you the stock has doubled from what you told me so he's like now at least sell it now it's double is triple from your price and you making good money sell it off you know i mean because these are really old price stocks now they are the fancies of the market they will come back a week later they like thank god i didn't I didn't uh, listen to you stock is doubled again from what you have told me from the last time we met so this got him pretty tensed you know in the sense that he didn't know if he was doing the right thing or if everyone else was doing the right thing he didn't know what was happening and he was a bit in depression at that point of time uh so he read one day in the uh, and and we lost a lot of clients at that point we lost a lot of clients at that point but he didn't budge he's like value investing this is what i'm going to do and this these are my this is what i'm convinced about and i'm going to stay this path he read one day in the econ- economist uh, um an ad on behavioral finance and that's what probably got him thinking you know maybe that's something i need to try out he's like anyway i'm so depressed here anyway clients are going maybe i'll just go here and see if if there's something here you know let me let me like he was always he was always in a quest for knowledge until his last day he always wanted knowledge i mean he wanted wisdom and he went he went and um, people or people told him why are you going are you, are, you, are you i mean look business is not doing good why are you just taking off he's like i need to find an answer i need to find an answer because there's something inherently wrong somewhere and i need to know that and what do you know like behavioral finance pretty much changed his life he went there he got that knowledge he came back super confident and super convinced even 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 more than before he left that what i was doing is the right thing and i am going to continue this path and he did and uh, we saw that again uh, when um, when we had the subprime crisis and the uh, uh, when the real estate stocks infrastructure power stocks all of them were going crazy like we didn't have anything in our portfolio at that point and again the same thing you know you don't have and you don't have any real estate stocks you don't have any infrastructure stocks and they like and that time he was even more confused he's like you know this is a disaster for recipe and i'm not going to get there and i'm not going to get into these things like what everyone is doing i don't want to do it so what behavioral finance really taught him is like don't follow the herd you know it's let's not go with the herd mentality be fearful when others are greedy greedy when others are fearful and again we didn't do that and our pms outperformed like really really outperformed and uh, the returns we've got i mean since our inception to even till we closed the pms in 2012 13 was phenomenal you know we we had we had we we, we gave 19 and a half percent cagr returns over that period which was which was pretty good which is pretty good with the with, and without any risk taking you know that was, that was the best part so <clears throat> So those are the kind of so, so so in a nutshell I just I didn't want to make it too long so I just want to tell you his story about how he started and what hardships he faced and I think it's a great inspiration for us and it's a it's a lot of lessons in life that he he actually taught me and I I mean he did teach me but I actually it it comes into force only when he's not there you know I mean all the things he did all the things he told me i mean only after he's not there do i realize wow this was really awesome you know like this guy was he was something the amount of goodwill we have pouring in the amount of support uh, i mean the 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 amount of hearts he touched is just phenomenal i didn't know that so today i had like three ex employees who came to just visit me to give their condolences and Uh, one of them has been an ex employee for like 12 years he's not worked with us he left 12 years back some another one was about 8 or 9 years and the other one was 6 years and i didn't know my father was still helping them out after all this year he was he, he was helping them out in uh, educating their children and none of us knew i mean i didn't know one uh, one of the ex uh, ex colleagues uh, 
he his 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 son uh, he just came to meet dad a few years back and uh, he just uh, showed him a video or a audio of his son playing so my dad like what is this so he's like he's playing a guitar so my dad's like he plays a guitar and like he gave him his guitar at that very point so he was really compassionate uh, really honest person um, full of humility courageous and full of passion i mean he wanted to since a very small age he wanted to learn how to play the guitar and he didn't get a chance until he was 51 at 51 he took up taking guitar lessons and that was something which i was like wow i mean you know he had that in the back of his mind like he followed every passion of his made be gol for uh guitar or again like two years back my mom actually told him that because he was playing the guitar and he was singing a song and my mom was like parag you're an awful singer and uh, the next day he went and take singing classes and for the last three years he's be had been taking singing classes and guitar classes and he did improve quite a bit you know he was he was playing at our family events he was playing the guitar and singing songs which was which is great because Two years back, we were like, "Dad, please don't sing. You know, it's not happening." <laughs> so that was that. And uh, also, one other thing, investment and in his professional life, it's easy to follow certain things. You know, like greed and fear. I mean, though it's very hard, but he tried to put all those in his personal life. You know, he cut out greed from his personal life. It wasn't just about investments or about. any of those things it was just about in his in his entire life he's like if i have to be a person who can say no to greed and fear i need to i cannot just have it in one part of my life and not have it in my other part of my life it's not going to work he made sure in all his in in every aspect of his life all these things weren't there like he made a conscious effort that greed and fear wasn't there his only fear was he had one though uh, and uh, most of you all must have heard him say this uh, say this line quite a few times in the last few months you only know aging when you age i think a lot of you must have heard him say that and uh, that was his thing he didn't want to suffer at old age and i guess he won't you know and that was what he wanted um, that was his only fear he's like neil i just don't want to suffer in old age because he had seen his mom and dad go through that for 5 years and he had told me if i'm ever on life support just yank it off and let me go and uh, that's what and one at one point he also said that i wish i go in my sleep or i or i go in an accident he actually said that you know he actually said that and uh, god gave him what he wanted you know i mean uh, he he really did last 2 years we came out with a mutual fund and i have not seen that man so excited about anything than a mutual fund you know because he's like we've got something so so great here you know we have we have we have we took 6 months to actually uh, frame our mutual fund and at least get the structure out of our mutual fund and he was excited he's like for him that was his giving to the society the mutual fund was his way of giving to the society because he's like i've got the best thing here i have i don't have multiple scheme again going against the herd again challenging the status quo that's all he want to do he's like i don't want multiple scheme i want one scheme where we can do everything in there and let's design it in such a way and he was so excited and he was so confident that this was the product that people need and then this is what people should at least have in their portfolio in their asset allocation and uh, he worked he worked in, in the last two years he probably worked harder than he worked in his last 10 years you know and uh, he was traveling and he was he was just so passionate about the fund and for me it was about um, we were in office we talk about the fund from the office to the house we talk about the fund over the drink talk about the fund having dinner talking about the fund before going to sleep he spoke about the fund so we so literally breathe the mutual fund and and i today i just know what what his dream was and what his vision was and his dream and vision was this mutual fund and 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 that's the legacy i need to grow we need to grow uh, team ppfas needs to grow people fof he started um, and he would want us to just continue with it and grow it larger and larger he was really really excited every time we had an fof he was really excited about it he used to be the first one here and the last one out and uh, he he was really he was he, he was really excited about these things you know and uh, 
our job is to just grow his legacy. Um, if if he was he was also obviously uh, very fond of writing books. He's written two books. Uh, and if he had to write his third book, and if it was about himself, I have no doubt he wouldn't change a thing about how his life turned out. I don't think he would change one thing because he lived a fulfilled life. He lived a very content life. He was very grateful. And uh, even in his last, God gave him what he wanted. He didn't suffer at all. Uh, what we hear is it was pretty immediate. So uh, he lived a pretty complete life. And I just wanted to... Uh, say that and uh, the other thing was there was one more event that took place in the last one month which was the Berkshire Hathaway event um, which some of us here have did go for so I'm just going to invite Ronak first uh, to talk about the the Berks the value investing conference and uh, the show must go on so this is the FOF starts here now thank you uh, can you hear me at the back yeah great uh, I have been with PPFS Mutual Fund for the past six years. I am in their research team. And I would like to share some of the experiences I had at Omaha at an event called as the Value Investors Conference. So Omaha is like a very quiet town during the entire year. But when the Berkshire event approaches, there is a lot of activity, a lot of people, a lot of like-minded investors who follow Warren Buffett and his teachings. They throng to Omaha and they conduct these private events. So one such event is uh, the Value Investors Conference, which is hosted by a person named Robert Miles. So Robert Miles uh, has this entire week before the AGM. He organizes uh, the Genius of Warren Buffett lecture series, where they discuss uh, Warren Buffett's ideas of investing and how he applied them over his entire career. Uh, Robert Miles, if you are not aware, is also an author of a nice book called The Warren Buffett CEO. And this book talks about uh, the CEOs that run Berkshire Hathaway owned companies and what are the common points which make them the best managers in the industry. So the Value Investor Conference itself is a two day event which uh, starts at the end of the Genius of Warren Buffett course. But this time it was a three part event where they also added a new part on Charlie Munger which we could not attend this time because we were not aware of that. But we did attend the Value Investors Conference. And there are a lot of marquee speakers who come to this event. Uh, some of them which are very popular across the world as fund managers, uh, like John Murray Avilard of the First Eagle, or Tom Russo of Russo Gardner, or even Lauren Templeton of Templeton Funds, or people like William Thorndike whose book, The Outsiders, we enjoyed reading so much. So a lot of marquee people come to this event. But I would like to focus on the three key talks which I really enjoyed, and something that I would learn from immediately and share it with you guys. So the first talk is basically a dinner that a dinner talk which Thomas Russo gave and he's been a fund manager since the 80s and is an old guard and he talks about value investing a lot but one key thing he keeps talking year after year at every event he goes at every lecture he gives is the capacity to suffer and if you read that sentence he might sound like a masochist but actually the sentence is far deeper than that. Uh, so the capacity to suffer with which he intends to say is that he only likes to invest in businesses or management teams who have the capacity to suffer short term uh, losses for the long term game which they have planned. And a lot of times uh, a management which plans to have a long term vision has to suffer or has to stumble through some of the teething issues of their businesses and in the longer term the results are more apparent as the margins grow or the business grows and the return, of cap return on capital keeps growing. So if you want to invest in such businesses and if you are a long term investor, even you as an investor need to have the capacity to suffer along with the companies. So just because the company has a down quarter or a result which was not as good as the analyst expectation, it should not deter you from staying invested in the firm. It should not make you afraid that what am I sitting on, what am I holding in my portfolio. In fact, if you have done the research right and if you know that the company and the management is sound, you should stick with them. In fact, in the future we might do a, a detailed talk on Tom Russo and the presentation that he gave. Uh, the other, other person I would like to highlight is a, a lady, a fund manager from New York, from Daruma Capital. And her talk was a very short talk, but in that talk she gave a very insightful understanding of what is happening around us today. So her name is Mariko Gordon and 
she started talking about the digital age you know how we are engulfed with too many devices how much how too much information comes to us every day and how we are lost in the sea of information and sometimes we don't decipher what is real information and what is noise so <coughs> her whole idea was to disconnect ourselves from the digital world and she says that the analog ways of researching businesses you know previously people used to read the annual reports and do management meetings research the business by talking to suppliers talking to customers build your understanding about the business so she says that is the key to actually understand businesses even today in the digital world and she gives uh, three points which i find i can understand uh, which i can uh, share with you now is the first point is she says that you behave like a village idiot when you start looking at a company because that gives you an idea of asking the very basic questions about what this business is about how it works who are the people running the business and are they capable enough to keep running the business going ahead and when you do that basic analysis when you ask such very key questions you come to the crux of the investment thesis instantly rather than you going the longer way and reading articles about the business or reading the numbers and trying to figure out what the business is up to although those are also required but when you ask the very basic questions and you look for the very basic answers you might actually hit the gold mine sooner rather than waiting for the longer time and she says that because of too much information and the digital age where we get information very instantly we might just do a google search on something that we want to learn about the business and we actually find it and that's a bad thing sometimes because we may not actually do the go through the pains of looking at all the long history of the company and finding the anomaly over there and we might just find information we are looking for which we know as confirmation bias and we might get convinced instantly about the idea being good or not so the time taken the pain and the process in learning about the business is also very important rather than just clicking on google and finding what we want the second point she made which was very interesting is and which people talk about but i don't know how many actually apply is you start building thought experiments so what that means is you start looking at a business from different scenarios so if you are running a retail business you see what happens if the products that you are retailing go out of fashion you know that is a good scenario to figure out how the business can die or what if tomorrow your business grows 10x do you have the management capability or the bandwidth to run this business and all these kind of thought experiments if you run and try to figure out about the business from that point of view you get an idea if that is the business or the management capable of delivering on all these outcomes and it may also happen that you come up with wrong conclusions but you at least have some scenarios in your mind where you have gone through the idea and you will not be jittered when something opposite happens based on your understanding so building thought experiments is one thing and something which i don't do personally and which i want to start doing is to run postmortems so lot of time what happens is when time goes on and we have had good investments or bad investments we generally tend to forget them okay fine paisa banaya i am happy or paisa gawaya kyu sochne ka bar bar it's too much too stressful for me but she says you have to dig your own uh, research ideas from the past and find out what you have succeeded in and what you have failed in and find out the reasons why you actually got lucky or were successful because of your insight or you failed because you were unlucky or you were actually thinking in the wrong way and this analysis actually helps you grow as a better analyst and to analyze the businesses better in the future so when that bedrock is built of knowledge and experience this is what knowledge and experience actually means it's not just knowing about the business but knowing where your strengths and weaknesses are in identifying such businesses in the future so i mean a lot of times when we look at businesses through financial statements we come across a very 2d world whereas the business is actually three dimensional it's a messy living breathing organism where thousands of employees work and a lot of things happen which the owner of the business or the managers of the business may not be always aware so when you do this kind of a three pronged analysis of a business or investment thesis you actually focus on the bigger picture the 3d picture of the business rather than being clubbed into the 2d world of the financial statements or the operating margins or the return ratios and so on although they are also important but the key part is getting the basic stuff right the third person and the third talk which i would like to highlight is pretty interesting so <coughs> this guy is <coughs> for gregory leblanc is a professor at Haas School of Business and he's a historian by trade so what he did was 
an obvious thing for a historian to be in finance is to look at all the financial bubbles in the past and find common patterns. So when the talk actually started, I said, Arey, yeah, fir se, bubbles. I mean, we all know, we have read about bubbles till death and we have learnt about it, how the euphoria goes and how the bust happens, how people lose money and the cycle repeats year over year or over centuries it has happened. So this guy had a very interesting take. He says, fine, bubbles always happen, but why do they happen? I mean, we have some reasons to know why they happen, but are the people who always suffer in bubbles the non-experts or the general public or even experts fall prey to bubbles? So in their uh, economics class or their laboratory, what they call it, they did these thought experiments with actual traders coming in and uh, playing a mock game where every parameter was set and they were told to follow that parameter. And they realized from that through rigorous experimentation that even the experts get bubbles wrong and even they get carried away sometimes by herd mentality and he says that herding is not something uh, very unnatural for us it's something that we do very naturally it's like we always want to be comfortable we always want to go with where the warmth is where the fancy is because that is something we see so vividly and we understand very easily because everybody is doing that and we think are right, then even i can do it and that's where uh, herding actually hurts you after a point but till that point you're all happy so he says there are three things that work in a bubble. One is uh, the experience, because a lot of inexperienced people come into the market and they don't understand what they are doing and they just go with the flow. Second is liquidity, because since everybody is trading, there is a lot of liquidity in the market, a lot of demand is generated in the market. And third is because of the lack of experience, people start thinking, or people who are experienced but who are naive, they start thinking that this time it might be different from last time. And you know, let's see what happens this time. And then they also fail. So, one key point which he made and I would like to end with that is how do you safeguard, you know, we all know about bubbles but how do you actually protect yourself from bubbles and the answer was very simple, I was waiting for a huge revelation with drum music and all but nothing happened, the answer is quite simple, he said the only way to safeguard is to figure out what the thing is worth in your mind based on your judgement, your understanding and your experience and stick to it. That's all about the Value Investors Conference and I hope next time if I go there will be something in more interesting to share. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Hansel now, Hansel Thakkar, he had spoken last time as well. Uh, he will talk about the hype <laughs> which is justified about the Berkshire Hathaway AGM. Hansel, please. So this time it was indeed a hype, believe it or not. Uh one of the one of the points that actually shows that it was probably a high the sheer attendance and probably the highest ever as i think all the participants also realized so typically the agm would happen in the main hall but for the first time i think they booked rooms in the hilton and you know all the hotels around because there were apparently a lot of first time uh, attendees i think three are here uh, hardik was there kunal rupang were some of the people who attended for the first time as well. So uh, I think one of uh, one of the key learnings from me was uh, and how it was different from the last time was that the last time there was a lot of anxiety because all we heard you know we heard about this whole big AGM and you know how things happen you know these guys talk but this time surprisingly there was no excitement because you pretty much knew the drill right i mean you knew you had to go and stand there in line and you know at some point you were even detesting it like you know it's going to start at eight o'clock and you're standing in line at 4 45. but what i realized was that this time actually going without any expectations was even better than actually going with expectations because you didn't construct anything right and typically from what I understand a lot of people that I spoke over there what I did understand was that all of them actually go without any expectations because you never know what you what you uh, pretty much come away with so just a, a little statistic if you can see uh, I'm not sure if it's very clear but what you're uh, actually looking at is is an entire stadium Yeah, so this is a little more clear. This is the entire stadium, I mean, if you can notice it. And it's freaking packed. And I, I, I mean, even the last time when I went there, uh, the place from where this image is taken, you can't even see these guys, which is why they have so many TV screens. This portion, the last time was empty. This time, even this was packed. And there was absolutely no place to sit. If you see, the population of Omaha was, is, is around four and a half lakh people. This AGM alone increased the population by 12%. 
So, I mean, I don't know, you know, this whole herd thing and everyone running, if it has any indications, if it doesn't, I don't know. But there's another side of the story that says 50,000 people can't be wrong. You know, everyone's going there to possibly learn something. Anyways, what I thought would be interesting was now that, you know, all the dust was settled, at least for me, and uh, I actually had a chance to hear what they said. Um, you know, I had jotted down some notes and I did some reading on the internet, which kind of came up with, you know, certain interesting uh, one-liners and certain interesting uh, uh, quotes from Buffett and Munger, which uh, typically are revered worldwide. So, uh, some of this might sound repetitive, but, but trust me, one of the best things of the 50th landmark AGM was that it wasn't different. It was the same damn thing that was happening for the last 50 years. So, you would expect, you know, all fanfare and all, nothing. It was the same entry, the same two guys on the stage, the same people waiting to hear. So, what, what Buffett said was that investing is like swimming in the ocean, focus on swimming rather than predicting the tide, which kind of makes so much more sense. Saying your, when your actual job is to identify an investment, identify a company, just focus on the process. Don't try to time it, you know, when the next tide will come. Uh, uh, so another point, I think this uh, taking a ride off from what Ronak was saying, uh, don't ignore yearly warnings, but don't live by them either. There are often on good companies that have, you know, that run into headwinds, that have teething issues. Um, I think it was your theory of uh, what? Suffering, what, what, sorry, capacity to suffer. So, uh, what they're saying is that essentially there are companies that build through some suffering in the earnings. Don't essentially ignore these annual warnings, but at the same time, don't live by them either. Uh, this was an interesting quote. Uh, someone was actually questioning uh, one of the questions raised to uh, both these guys was uh, their large interest in IBM. Okay, incidentally, our fund also happens to own a substantial stake in IBM. And uh, people always wonder as to how Buffett was completely anti-tech and he didn't really understand technology stocks, but here he was buying IBM. Um, and and there, was, there was a discussion that ran in uh, between Buffett and, uh, and uh, Charlie Munger, and Charlie Munger pretty much said very clearly that, uh, no, you know, I think it's a great investment. The company is also buying stock. We are also buying stock. And uh, Buffett kind of tried and explained to them that this is a credible b brand, you know, this is a solid company, they find ways to reinvent themselves. And uh, Buffett said that, you know, <laughs> I don't understand how so many people can, you know, constantly get it wrong. To which Munger says, if people weren't wrong so often, we, won't be, we wouldn't have been so rich. So, this is a classic, uh, this is a classic Munger. I mean, one line, you know, snap, say the whole story and let's not bother about everything else. Uh, another uh, interesting point uh, they mentioned was about uh, activism. So there was um, one of the opening questions on the AGM was kind of, you know, head on, spearhead, you know, guys accusing these, uh, the pair of, um, you know, kind of anti-governance uh, measures working with, uh, you know, a, a hedge, uh, uh, not a hedge fund, but a fund basically called 3G which had jointly acquired certain businesses uh, like Kraft and Heinz and, and, and those kind of businesses with Buffett. But they were not in tune with the so-called culture of, uh, of Berkshires because these companies, the guys at 3G were extremely ruthless, just go fire people left, right and center, focus only on profitability. And at that time, uh, you know, I think one of the statements, I think Buffett made this statement was that, you know, the best defense against activism is a good performance. He also, however, made another statement that you will see a lot later uh, about, uh, uh, you know, having too many people in a company. So he said that at, at no point will any, any company go out and say that, uh, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our, uh, you know, we plan to have too many employees, which uh, kind of got that discussion going on towards macros and economics. And uh, let me just fast face because there was a fantastic, uh, uh, yeah, there. so that's the statement. So which ran into uh, about, you know, companies having too many employees, to which Warren Buffett said that we think any company that has an economist has one too many employees. And just imagine, probably out of 50,000 people, I think around 14,000 might have been economists over there. So he just just clean wiped them off off the board. Uh, I think what that kind of uh, kind of takes you into uh, is is you know 
the very simple thought process of these guys, the simple uh, methods, uh, uh, you know, how grounded they are. Imagine one guy is 85, the other one is 91. Both of them know that they can't speculate on how long they're going to be around. Both of them know that they have 60 billion dollars just to throw anywhere and yet they're so rational. I mean, you will not find either one of these guys passing any lewd comments. Uh, someone uh, raised a question on another large holding of, uh, of Berkshire called Coca-Cola and they said that uh, health patterns are going towards people consuming you know these uh, coke kind of drinks a lot lesser than uh, uh, lesser than they would and uh, they asked Buffett whether the moat of Coca-Cola was actually shrinking so to that Buffett, Buffett said that uh, you know, uh, the whole concept of Coca-Cola being happiness and he said that, you know, when I have Coke, I, I, I feel happy and uh, uh, for the number of years that he has actually consumed uh, Coca-Cola, a quarter of his calories would essentially be Coke. He just said, I didn't know which quarter of it was, uh, was Coca-Cola. And another thing he said that if I had eaten broccoli and Brussels sprouts, I don't think I would have lived, lived so long. So he's saying, no one eats broccoli and feels happy, but if I have a Coke, I feel happy. So he said, Coke has such a wide moat, you know, there might be issues, but one thing he was very sure about was that uh, over the next 20 years, Coke will sell a lot more uh, uh, six packs than they do or whatever, whatever it is that they do. Uh, one of the questions raised over there was uh, their view on, the, on, on currencies in general and uh, there is this very famed reporter called Rebecca Quick or Becky Quick who has been uh, tracking Buffett for the last, I think, 11 years and she has possibly had some of the best interviews. So Becky Quick was one of, one of the reporters on the panel who asked this question and she asked Bill Gates as to which currency he thought, I mean, whether uh, Bill Gates, if, if given three timelines, five years, 10 years, 20 years, which would possibly be the currency or would they be in, in looking at the dollar as a solid currency? Interestingly enough, Bill Gates said that you know he would probably buy the currency pack because he sees a lot of interest going around in the rest of the world minus US, to which Buffett pretty much replied that I think the dollar will be the reserve currency of the world 50 years from now. Um, yeah, Neil, for the next point, I'll probably bring you on. You know, that whole concept of you not knowing how your dad was uh, kind of, you know, just doing his whatever philanthropy. Uh, I think at one of the points, Buffett mentioned that uh, there is no Forbes 400 in the graveyard. So, no one pretty much is, is ranked uh, philanthropy straight from the heart. Uh, we covered The Economist. Yeah, so someone uh, asked a question on Greece and... Uh, you know, they asked him, what, what is your thought of the Eurozone, to which, uh, this is again Charlie Munger, classic. Uh, they created something that's unwise. You can't form a business partnership with your frivolous drunk brother-in-law. I mean, <laughs> this guy is just classic. So, uh, that was their view on, on the Eurozone. Uh, this AGM essentially had a lot of focus, I think, on interest rates. Uh, on asset classes, on the impact of interest rates on asset classes and I think one of the most amazing parts was Buffett actually coming forward and saying that he was wrong because he did not really anticipate interest rates remaining so low uh, for such a uh, stretched period of time. Uh, so there, there it is. So far I've been wrong on interest rates. It's so hard for me to believe that you can drop money from a helicopter and have no inflation. But we haven't. Now here, um, he also mentioned that if, if interest rates continue to be low, essentially equities will be even cheaper because debt will not be able to give you any yield. So that will be an asset class out. And the simple structure of the balance sheet of an equity company will actually do a lot better because there is no overhang of debt. Um, another very interesting point that uh, they did mention at this point was uh, a question that came up on minimum wage. Uh, there is this whole talk in the US of increasing the minimum wage, but uh, I think Charlie Munger it was said that 70% of the people who are essentially on minimum wage are people who are not the primary earners of the family. So it could be, you know, the kids, the sons, you know, daughters, whatever, who are doing all these McDonald kind of jobs. And uh, he said that if we increase minimum wage, that 70% essentially is going to go spend money haphazardly on, on you know, your dispensable income which will essentially drive inflation. 
contrary to that, uh, what he suggested was that uh, what was that uh, he believed in something called the interest. Uh, no, sorry, income tax credit. I honestly haven't figured out what that is. Uh, I haven't read on it. But uh, what I did, uh, kind of just before coming here, I thought I should just catch up on that. But one of the articles I read on Google said that, uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, you know, the uh, the experts in the U.S. are actually considering this to be a better mechanism than, you know, uh, increasing minimum wage. So that was on interest rate and inflation. Um, so we told you, I mean, rather I told you how they valued ra being rational so much. And uh, one of the statements I think, uh, uh, I think Charlie Munger made, made that statement saying that being rational is a moral imperative and you should never be stupider than you need to be. Um, and after that he said rationality is a moral duty. Yeah, that was Buffett I think. Rationality is a moral duty and Berkshire is a sort of a temple of rationality. This just goes to show you how simple these guys are. I mean, uh, you know, what you see is what you get. Very interesting point. Uh, on reputation they made hardly anything is more important than behaving uh, well as you go through life. This was the answer uh, uh, to I think one of a teenager who had asked a question as to you know what is most important to you and I think that was a question I'm not sure though. Hardly anything is more important than behaving well as you go through life. We try to behave better as we become more prosperous. I recommend you follow these old-fashioned principles. Uh, when you get old, you'll get the reputation you deserve. Uh, I think that one statement says everything about, you know, your your corporate governance, um, you know, your principles, probably what, you know, what, what Paraguay also uh, adhered to. And finally, uh, this question, uh, this quote came uh, when there was a little bit of a discussion on finding the successor to uh, finding the successor to Berkshire uh, in, in case it is of any interest or if there's a betting pool going on I think number one is Ajit Jain on the list uh, who's running their insurance uh, namesake and uh, the other one was I think Abby Grail or something uh, the guy who's running the utilities business so these were the key takeaways that I thought anything I could have missed out uh, uh, you know probably will lie on the internet uh, and I thought uh, this time it was a far more solid uh, visit to the AGM because you are broadly disconnected from you know the, ex the the anxiety or the excitement of you know your first time to first time to Berkshire. I strongly recommend that you know if you guys get a chance, please do attend it. Thanks. to remember the law of the farm. You cannot sow something today and reap tomorrow. A seed has to go through various seasons before it turns into a fully blown tree. So is the case with investments. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.